Good to see you in God's house. I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook this morning. God bless you. Good to have you with us, Sajeev in India. God bless you, brother. We love you. And we're praying for you and for your ministry to grow and, and to develop leaders for these last days. Amen? That's what we need. We need leaders in these last days. Someone who's going to lead and not just kind of drift along. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up to the book of Genesis. And I want to share with you a message that God put up on my heart the other morning when I woke up. And I couldn't shake it. And the reason why I got this message was something that, uh, I'm going to tell you something. Everything comes out of prayer. In Monday night prayer, Lucy was here and she, she shared something. And one word she said sparked me to get on to this message. And so um, I want you to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12, please. And I, I want to preach this morning on the prophetic promise. I want to preach on the prophetic promise. How many of you know that when God speaks, and he speaks things into existence that are not? Romans says that he speaks those things that are not as though they were. God is the one that speaks things. He creates things that are not as though they were. He speaks ahead of time, and he can create things just by his spoken word. He spoke the word and all the world came into order. The, the stars, the planets, everything just came together on his word. Well, I don't think you're getting excited. Praise God. Hallelujah. I, I, maybe we should hand out vitamins at the door and kind of get some peppies, get some peppy spirits in here. Amen. But uh, you can leave this up for a little while. I want people to get a hold of this. The prophetic promise that God gave and that God continues to give will bless you. Amen? We're going to start in verse 7. I know it's a kind of an odd place to start, but that's where God gave it to me. And it says, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham. You got your Bibles? Everybody's looking for the screen. Don't look for the screen. Look in your Bibles. Hallelujah. Open up your Bibles. Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. You know, sometimes I think the, the, the one up on the screen makes people lazy. They don't bring their Bible to church anymore. But they bring their phone. Hello. They will never forget their phone, but they forget their Bible. Shame, shame, shame. <laughs> or if you have one on your phone, praise God. Open up your Bible on your phone. Thank you, Jesus. The scripture says in verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram. Genesis 12, verse 7. The Lord appeared unto Abram. Now you know Abram was Abraham. His name was changed later on. But I want to stick on this word for one moment. The word, the word that appeared. It says, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham. Something had to happen with Abraham in order for God to appear to him. Does anyone know what that is? Well, if you read uh, verse 1 of chapter 12, you don't have to read there, but you can look at it later. It says, God said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy, get away from thy kindred, from thy father's house. Let me read it verbatim, because I'll, I'll mess it up. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee, and make thee great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And verse 4 says, so Abraham, what? Abraham continued waiting on God. Abraham waited for the for the invention of GPSs so he could get the right direction. He waited for AAA to get a trip tick. No, he didn't. The Bible says that he didn't know where he was going. And that tells me that Abram had a trust in God in his direction. Even though he didn't really know God that well. He was a pagan, heathen, idolater. Are you hearing me? 
Abraham was an idolater when God called him. That's why God said, get away, get out from thy kindred, from thy country, to a place that I'll show you. So the reason why verse 7 comes and God says, the Lord appeared. Now God spoke to Abram, but it doesn't say he appeared to Abram. But in verse 7 he says, the Lord appeared unto Abram. There was a manifestation, if you will, of who God was. It's called a theophany. A theophany is a manifestation of God. You might remember Jacob, when he was wrestling with the angels, says he wrestled with God. It was a theophany. God came in a human form and was wrestling with Jacob. God appeared to Abraham, a theophany. He saw, not the fullness of God, because no man can see God in his fullness and live. And so the Lord appeared to Abram and he said, now watch this now. God said, when God speaks, he doesn't speak for no reason. He doesn't just speak to flatter people. He doesn't speak just to make a, a nice a conversation. But God said, unto thy seed, Will I give this land? Unto thy seed will I give this land. Well, you know, Abraham was married to Sarah. And you know, married people, they do have relationships, right? They do have relations. And up until this time, Abram did not have any children. Probably during this time of of having children, having children was a time of showing God's blessing. And here they were trying to have children. They couldn't have children. For some reason, they couldn't have children. And I believe it's because God had not spoken the word yet to Abram. Hallelujah. He said, unto thy seed will I give this land. And when God spoke to Abraham or Abram, he just got up and went his own way and did his own thing, didn't he? He just walked back into his everyday life, didn't he? No, the Bible says that when God spoke to him, that he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared to him. In other words, he started a relationship with God. He was determined that once God appeared to him, and spoke to him that there was something inside of him that was stirring and saying, I cannot go back to those idol worships that I had before that never spoke to me, never appeared to me. They were only stone. But I, I, I sense something about this God that he spoke to me, and I must, must have a place that I can go and worship him. There has to be a place where I can go and hear from him. He gave, God gave a promise of blessing, a seed, and possession of land. And both are prophetic future. Not for the very present time Abraham was there. God calls those things that are not as though they were. And he says, you're, you're going to be blessed. Why was God now blessing Abraham? Huh? Because blessing comes. Hear me now. Blessing comes when we're obedient. God told Abraham, get away from thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, and I'll bless you. Blessing comes when we're obedient. God doesn't lie. He said seed. The seed is futuristic. It wasn't seen. Does that sound familiar to you? The seed was futuristic. What God said was futuristic. Does that seem kind of familiar to you? Remember that, that word that says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things? Not seen. Not seen. 
Hallelujah. To have faith isn't just a proclamation. It's something of a strong, deep, rooted agreement with God in your heart. You know that you know that you know. Why did he build an altar? It was the first time mentioned that Abram dedicated a place for sacrifice and to commune with God. He began a relationship with God at this altar. It is the place where you and I can go. Listen to me now. It's the place where you and I can go when the prophetic word or promise seems to be delayed to get encouragement and peace. The Bible says he began to call upon the name of the Lord. Sometimes God will speak a prophetic word to you and I. And we haven't seen it come to pass. And so during this time of process, there comes a test. A test comes during the process of waiting for that prophetic word to come to pass. It's a time of testing. You don't have to turn there, but in Genesis 12, 11 to 13, it's a story, you know the story, it came to pass when, uh, when Abram was going into Egypt, that he said to his Sarah, his wife, you know, behold, the Egyptians are going to look and see that you're beautiful, and that you're, you're a knockout, you're a ten. And they're going to look on me and they're going to say, man, I want, I want his wife. And they're going to kill me. I'm paraphrasing. But they're going to kill me. So tell them you're my sister. I want you to know something. Failure in the test does not nullify the prophetic word. Hear me now. Failure in the test does not nullify the prophetic word. For what God said he will do, he will do. Abraham lied. He just came from the altar. He just came from fellowshipping with God, and yet he lied because he was fearful of his life because he didn't really have a full grasp of what God was saying. He didn't see the immediate result. Imagine that. Here he is. God's speaking to him. God appears. A theophany of God appears to him. That's why some people say, well, I'd be living different if, I, if Jesus was alive. They know you wouldn't. Here, he just got out of the presence of God. A theophany, a, 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 visible, a visible manifestation of God. He just came into contact with God. God spoke to him, told him all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Gave him a tremendous prophetic utterance. And what is he doing now? He's lying. How can, God, how can the Egyptians kill him when God's prophetic word wasn't fulfilled yet? Don't ever believe the devil if he says, you serve God, I'll kill your children. Don't, don't ever believe that lie. Don't ever believe that God, you know, the enemy says, I'll come and I'll, I'll take your health and I'll do this if you continue on with God. You get any stronger with God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just blow things apart for you. God's made a promise. When God speaks a prophetic utterance to you, No matter what happens, that word will come to pass. No matter what. Instead of believing the prophetic word God had spoken to him and believing the word that in his seed, that was to him and his wife, he wouldn't have been killed. He didn't have to lie. Sometimes fear takes over. We get afraid. You know, is God really there? Is He really with us? Even in the trial, is He there? Does He care? Yeah, He's always where He's always been, and He's always be that where we where He is. He hasn't moved. 
God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is in your life and He's there to protect and to keep you. Now, just because I said that doesn't mean that we don't do our part. Abraham had to get up, leave his family, get out of his country, from his kindred, and just go by faith to a land that God was going to show him. No GPS. Not knowing where he was going. So what does Abram do now? The Egyptian Pharaoh comes and says, oh, that's your sister? Okay, he's going to take her. He gets her all dolled up, you know, gets her all ready. He's going to take her as his wife. And then something comes to Pharaoh and he goes, wait a minute. I've seen how you interact. Something's not right. This ain't your sister. This is your wife. And he finally confesses that. It's, he says, why did you do that I, for me to make this cinema? He says, take your stuff and get out of here. So Abraham gets out of the mess he's into. He travels down to Egypt because there was a famine in the land. We understand that. But what did, what did Abraham fail to do? We can infer that from the scripture that because he didn't build an altar to God down in Egypt. Can I tell you something? When you get away from the altar... When you get away from that relationship with God, you'll lie, you'll do things that are not right. You make wrong choices, wrong decisions. So what did Abraham do? Let's look in chapter 13, verse 1. The scripture says, Abram went out of Egypt he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south. Next verse, please. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. Look how God blessed him. See, you don't see it right out on the surface, but we know that Abraham got right with God. After the situation that he lied in, in, with his wife and he got confronted, his conscience... We know he got right with God because this was in his hot watch. Verse 4. Oh, that's it. Verse 3, I'm sorry. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel. Bethel in Hebrew is the house of God. Unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. Verse 4. Unto the place of the altar. Can I tell you the one thing the church needs to do today, and I'm talking about the generalized church, not just our church, is we need to get back to the altar. We don't need the flashy lights. We don't need the smoke. We don't need any of the gimmicks that men have brought into the church to try to win people's hearts. I'm going to tell you right now, you know where we win them? Right here at the altar. That's where we, that's where we can commune with God. That's where we begin have a deeper relationship with God. It's at the altar. Come on, somebody. He said, he went unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there, Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Woo! Verse 5. You will see how spending time with the Lord will enhance your decision making. Some of you may be in places where you need to make some decisions, and they're going to be life-changing decisions. Don't do it apart from the presence of the Lord. Allow God to choose your place of dwelling. Don't make decisions by your feelings or what looks right, look like what looks like the right choice because sometimes what looks right isn't right. Sometimes what looks right isn't right. Don't allow your decisions, listen to me, 
Don't allow your decisions to hinder the prophetic blessing that's coming in the future. Don't be like Lot. In Genesis 13, verse 10 to 13, it says this, And Lot lifted up his eyes. See, you can, you can, Abraham took his nephew, Lot, with him. He took him to be a blessing. But you know, you, know, you can have people with you and they're not with you. You can have people that are alongside you, but not on your side. And Lot was with him, but there was a contention among the men and the, with the livestock and the feeding and all of this. You know, how many, how, how many know that sometimes when God get, gives blessings, sometimes people get a little bit greedy. I always say this, the more, the more that you have, the more you better be willing to not let those things have you. Because one day God may say, give it away. If you can't give it away, guess what? You've got a covetous heart. You believe it all belongs to you, and you don't know something that don't belong to you, it belongs to God. Because if it wasn't for him, you would have nothing, I would have nothing. So Lot lifted up his eyes, and he beheld all the plain of Jordan, watch this now, that it was well watered everywhere. Wow, you mean I don't have to have people go and fetch it by pitchers and jars and come back and bring it to where we need it? Man, that thing's watered everywhere. Man, that's got to be God. Everything just fell right into place. It's got to be God, man. This, you know, he looked and he saw that and he said, he said, wow. Everywhere. It says, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, the garden of Eden. Wow, man, this is great. This must be the Lord. This must be where God wants me to be. Then verse 11 says, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot joined east, and they separated themselves one from the other. Abraham, who gave him the choice to choose first, it wasn't what was left over, so he had a choice. Just like you and I have a choice to follow Jesus or not to follow Jesus. But I want to tell you something. If you choose not to follow him and you know better, that's rebellion. It says a sin of witchcraft and you are under the deception of witchcraft and witchcraft is manipulating you and intimidating you and dominating you in your decisions. I know it's hard, but that's true. It's the truth. Now watch this. So Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from the other. And Abraham dwelt in the Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain. And he pitched his tent toward Sodom. You know what that tells me? That I don't believe Lot had a real relationship where he spent time at the altar with God. How many know that if you spend time with God, he's going to tell you what's of him and what's not of him? It says, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Abraham was willing to take what didn't seem like the best place or the easiest place to settle. Because he was willing to separate himself from the family of Lot and not continue in contention with them, but allowed them to choose first, God honored him but only after the separation. Only after the separation did God show him in the natural, the land that he had promised. Hallelujah.
The Bible says in verse 18, and my next point is position yourself to seek God. Abraham removed his tent, came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron. And what did Abram do? He built there an altar unto the Lord. You think he learned his lesson? Yeah. He learned his lesson. He built another altar. Now that these, these things were being acted on, it was for a reason. Whenever there is a prophetic word, listen to this now. Whenever there is a prophetic word in the process of being established, the enemy will try to cause havoc and confusion. Now the enemies of the surrounding countries that Abram was in began to fight and take possessions of lands and livestock and people, and they took Lot and his family captive. Abram hears about it, and now he has to fight in a battle that's not even his to fight. But because of fam family loyalty, he goes and rescues Lot and his family and his livestock and brings them all back. I want you to understand, the enemy will try to steal that prophetic word from you. Now, he can't ultimately defeat the prophetic word. But what he can do is cause you to not believe it, to walk away from it, to not desire it, and it hinders its fulfillment until God can get you back to the place you need to be to receive it. God's not going to bless you if you're in rebellion. This is every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above, and he adds no sorrow with it. So whatever blessing you have, if you have sorrow with it, it's not of God. Genesis 15, 1 says this, And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision. Now he's having visions. <laughs> First he hears God's voice. Then God appears to him. And now he has a vision. Hallelujah. And it says to him, what? Fear not, Abraham. Don't fear. Don't fear. Don't go be like you were in Egypt, man, when you were feared, when you feared and you had to lie. No, 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 no. Don't, don't fear, Abram. No need to fear. He says, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. He was going into battle with a, with a bunch of nations. Abraham said, Lord God, what will thou give me? Watch this now. Lord, what will you give me seeing I go childless? Huh? Him and his wife are still trying. She's still trying to get pregnant. But it ain't happening. He says, And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Now watch this. Sometimes, you know, the Bible says, For we prophesy in part and we know in part. And sometimes people, when they get a word from God, they may not get the whole thing. They may only get a portion of it. And sometimes they mess up on some parts. You know, like God's going to bring, my, bring me a husband. And all of a sudden you see this guy and, all, oh, he's the one. <laughs> no, no, he may not be the one. Hold on. Look what he says. Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. In other words, his bond servant, had a, they had a child in his house, and it's considered almost like his. So he said, that's how God's going to do it. God, see, God's going to do it that way. 
Sometimes we try to figure out God. Stop it. Stop trying to figure out how he's going to try to do it. Well, I wonder if it's going to come this way, that way, up this way, down this way. Where's it coming from? Stop it. Just believe God. You don't need to know how, when, where, and why he's going to do it. He's going to do it. He said, if he said he's going to do it, it's a prophetic word. It's going to happen. Don't try to help God make it happen. Amen? And then, behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This shall not be your heir. But, in other words, what God was saying to Abraham, if I can paraphrase it, Hey, dummy, what did I tell you? Out of your own loins, out of your own seed, your seed, not your bond servant seed, your seed, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make all the families of the earth be blessed through you. He shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of their own bowels shall be thy heir. How much more plainer does God have to be to you? And he brought him forth abroad and he said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed, prophetic future, be. The Bible says, if in this life we have hope, we have most men miserable. What's the prophetic word God's given to you? What has he spoken to you through his word, through your relationship at the altar with him? If thou be able to number the stars, he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And the Bible says in verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it for him for righteousness. Remember this word I'm giving you this morning. And the word is this. It's a process. It's a process. You will be tested It will look like it's not going to happen. It will look like there's a delay. And sometimes there is a delay because we're the ones that delayed it by not going to the altar for encouragement to get peace during the time of waiting. We sang that song. Here in your presence. Standing in your presence. We, sang, we heard that song just a few, few moments ago. Waiting on you. Sometimes when we wait on God, we get discouraged. Sometimes we're waiting on God to do things, and, and it doesn't seem like it's happening fast enough. That's the time you go to the altar, and you get encouragement. Because can I tell you, when you're at the altar, no man is an island. When you're at the altar, someone may just come up to you, put their hand on you, and stop praying for you, and give you the very word of encouragement that you that's why it's so important to be a part of a local body of believers. Body of believers that want to be used in the gifts of the Spirit. That desire spiritual gifts. So that when someone is at the altar and God gives you a word for that person, you're not going to sit there, oh, should I, could I, who, should I, would I, who, who, would I? Wouldn't you want to be encouraged? And you go and you go up to that person and you, and you, you just start praying for that person. You don't know what that would mean to somebody. But instead, you want to sit, sit in a chair and just be so concerned about yourself, hello, that you're not using the gift that God gave you when he speaks that word. Now watch this. The dictionary, or the definition of the word according to Webster's Dictionary on the word process. Listen to this. A natural phenomenon marked by gradual changes that lead toward a particular result. A series of actions or operations conducting to an end. Conducting meaning to lead or attend to a particular or often desirable result. 
Remembering the prophetic word God gave to you will only be enhanced as you spend time at the altar and not looking at the well-watered plains that you see. When you just look and see things in the natural, you have a tendency to make your natural decisions. You go by logic, and you go by reason. And you say, well, A equals B equals C, C equals C, so therefore, and your decision making becomes a formula. Rather than getting on your knees and saying, God, what do you think? Now see, Joe's in the banking business and he knows about investments. If I asked you, Joe, if I asked, I'm going to use him, okay? If I asked you to say, say you had $50,000. And if you do, I would be your best friend. <laughs> Which I is my best friend anyway. Okay? And, I, and, and someone said to you, put this in this stock. Now you didn't know anything about the stock. He didn't know anything about the stock, but he had a feeling. Had an emotion. And then, a guy who was a multi, multi billionaire that knows the person of this stock that owns this company. And he tells you, I know for sure that if you invest this money within five years, you'll have a, half, a million and a half dollars. Who are you going to go with? You're going to go with the person that really knows versus the person that doesn't know. Can I tell you, when you make your decision apart from the altar of God, that's what it's like. You're going with no knowledge at all. You're going with your knowledge. But when you go to God who knows everything, the, 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 the end, the middle, and the, and the beginning, the middle and the end, He knows everything. He knows what's going to happen. He knows if you're going to lose that investment. I remember a friend, I remember a friend of mine it's a true story. Went to Brother Norman's church. Uh, I can't, what was, it? what was his name? Oh, gosh. His name escapes me right now. Uh, Bento. Kenny Bento. He was talking like this, remember? Oh, praise God, praise God, praise God. Okay. okay. God told him, now this was back in the 80s. Okay. He was praying and praying. He wanted, to buy a, he wanted to buy a house. Okay. God told him, he says, put your money in the stock right, right over here. I don't know, I forget how much he had, maybe 20000 down payment, whatever he had for the house. Listen to me. What he had for the house, how many know that God sometimes asks you to take a risk? That's what faith is. Faith is a risk. See, when I, when I, when I first rented this place, I had to put my name on the lease. I was responsible for a quarter of a million dollars, not knowing if people would show up or what people we did have if they would stay. That's a lot of money. So God told him to put this twenty or 25000 whatever it was, in stock and leave it there. So he did. Now, I'm talking back in the 80s now, okay? I think he waited five years, and it was growing. He had like, I think, $65,000, $75,000. That's pretty good back then, Okay? And it was pretty good. And when he gave this testimony, I still remember it. When he gave this testimony, he said, I wanted to keep it in there because it was getting bigger. He said, but I prayed and God told me, take it out and pay cash for your house. He took it out, paid cash for his house, and that year that stock went all the way down. See, he had a place called the altar that he went to and spoke with God. You and I have to do the same thing with our life. You have gifts and you have talents that God has given you. And if you're just sitting there and you're not, you're not using those gifts, you're robbing yourself of a blessing. Sometimes people will talk with me and say, oh, pastor, I got this problem, I got that problem, I got this problem. I ask them, first question I ask them, did you pray about it? No. Well, I can't help you then. Why are you coming to me? 
If you're not praying and seeking God for the answer, I can't help you. See, God helped Joe only after he responded to his invitation. That's how God works. He wants obedience. And the moment you're obedient, and the moment you walk to that place that he has for you, guess what? The windows of heaven begin to open up, and now the blessings start coming in. Amen. It happens. It happens. When we're obedient, God blesses us. Okay? When that fireman died that I had to do the funeral for, that fireman, I think most of you know that when I went, I did that, that funeral. I wanted to do something special for the, for the wife. I didn't want to bring flowers. He wasn't a religious person at all, so forget anything like that. So I'm home and I'm saying, God, what can I do for this, this family that will encourage them, will lift them up? And the Lord brought me back to the time in this, uh, August when I went to the, uh, the, the uh, Massachusetts Association of Police Memorial Services, once a year they have that, I was invited to go. And all the chiefs and all the uh, commissioners in Massachusetts were there. I'm sitting in the second row with all of these high influence people and all this stuff. Well, anyway, I'm sitting there, right, and the governor's there, and the attorney general's there, and all these people are there. And I hear this guy sing. He's called a singing trooper. He was a former state trooper 20 years, and then he retired. But he sings. He's got a great voice. I mean, he sang at the Boston Garden, at the Gillette Stadium, the Celtics games, the Bruins games. I mean, he, the national anthem. He sings all over the United States. The Lord says, call him. Have him come and sing at this fireman's funeral. Now, see, here's where your rationale can get you into trouble. God, this was on a Tuesday. The funeral was on a Thursday. I said, there's not enough time. He's probably booked. Well, how can I get him to come here? He travels all over the United States. I don't even know if he's here. And the Lord said, call him. So I called him. I talked to his wife. I told the situation. She says, well, she says, usually for, for him to come and do a performance, it's $500. Because that's, that's how they make their living. I believe he's a Christian. I, I believe they're a Christian. And, and so uh, I may have him come here with his wife and minister or something. He asked me if he could come. I said, yeah, we'll try to work it sometime in the spring or, fall, or in the summer. And um, so she said to me, well, I said, well, I, I, you know, this is coming out of my pocket. I'm paying for this. And she said, well, what can you, come, what can you pay? And I said, I don't want to insult you. <laughs> I said, you know, you get in that position, you feel funny. You know, you know. I know if I was Nigerian, I'd say $10. Okay, that's all Nigerians are. I've been to Nigeria six times. I can tell you about how they are. If you offer a CD and you say to them, you want to buy my CD, you say, how much? Oh, whatever you want to give, they'll give a dollar. That's how they are. It's, they don't mean anything by it, but that's how they are. They'll give you the, the lowest price they can give you. Okay? So she said, no, no, no. She said, please. She says, We're, he, he's singing this afternoon, but we might be able to make it. So she says, tell me how much you can afford. I said, $100. She says, let me get back to you. So she calls her husband to see if he's be willing to do it and all this other stuff. I'm sitting there, and, and the Lord brings to my remembrance, they saying, they said, the Fire, Fire Fund Association said that they would give me $50 to do this service. Ten minutes later, she calls back, says he'll do it. I said, well, I just remembered, they're going to give me $50 for doing the service. I'll give that to you for your husband. 150 She goes, you sure? I said, yeah. Watch, it. Watch how God does things. So I did that, and I gave her, I gave, when they came, they sang beautiful, two songs. And, and the song that I was there, I was, I, was, I was laying in bed in the morning, and I'm saying, okay, God, which song should I pick for him, right? 
And the song, You Are the wing, Wind Beneath My Wings, came to my heart. So I asked him if he sang that. He said, yeah. And then the wife called me to make sure of the times and all that stuff. And she says, you know, she says, uh, I wish somebody would sing his favorite song, My Way, by Frank Sinatra. I said, well, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can make that happen, but, you know, we'll see if I know anybody. So I called him back, and I asked him, I said, do you sing My Way? He says, oh, yeah, I sing that all the time. So he gets to the, the funeral, and when I told the, one of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, firemen that's a, a, in charge of the, the uh, union what this guy was going to sing, he said, my God, did you know? I said, no, what? That was their wedding song. They were married five years ago. That was their wedding song. You are the wind beneath my wing. So he gets there and he starts singing. Well, she bawls and she's smiling and crying. She's happy and sad at the same time. And then he sings my way. And all of the friends begin to cry and weep. Because they, he was a karaoke guy. He used to like to sing. And he sang it all the time for his friends. So all his friends were bawling and rise up. Okay. So it was all over. I gave him his $150. So I'm on my way to Connecticut last week to go preach. I get a phone call from the Yacht Club where I work. They said, this Bob? I said, yes. He said, this is the Yacht Club. I said, yes. They said, at the end of the year, we go through all of our finances, and whatever's left, we split up everything for everybody. And we have a check for you for $150. But that, I don't believe what it came. You have to release to receive. If you're just a taker, a taker, a taker, a taker, it won't come. But if you're a giver, God will return back to you. Amen? Remembering the prophetic word that God gave to you will only be enhanced as you spend time at the altar, as you wait upon God, don't do anything through your own reasoning, and your own intellect, and your own thinking of what you think looks better. Always do it if God speaks that word to you and confirms it to you in your spirit. And if it's not there, wait upon Him. How many know that sometimes when God says no, or He says wait, that is because he knows something's coming. He knows, what's, he knows what's best. He knows if there's a disaster coming. He knows if there's a loss of income coming. He knows everything. So if you go according to his will and his prophetic voice, rather than your reasoning, intellectual thinking, guess what? doesn't seem right. God, how can I call this man two days' notice? He's going to be seeing us somewhere in the world. If I would have listened to that, that woman would have lost out on the blessing, and I would have lost out on the blessing. But because I was willing to overcome my thoughts and intellect and say, no, God, you're speaking this to my heart. I'm going to do it, and it will come to pass. He'll be available. And for the money, I, I hope that I can, he'll, he'll do it. And when he got there, he told me this. He said, Bob, he says, I've sang in... He says, I've sang in football stadiums with thousands and thousands of people. He says, singing at this man's memorial is more important to me than any of those things I've ever done. He says, I'd be more than glad to do that any time. Oh, see, when we have misconceived ideas, oh, it's going to be too much money, this and that. We start talking ourselves out of a blessing. Wait on God for that prophetic promise that he's given you. If he said he'd do it, he's going to do it. Sometimes it's the seed. Now let me tell you this. God promised Abraham, he says, I'm going to give you, you're going to be blessed, and your seed's going to be blessed, and all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Did he just sit back, fold his hands, and say, okay, God, go ahead, do it? No, so, something had to take place. He had to have relationships with his wife. Hello? He had to do his part. Then how come, after a few years of, a few more years of testing, 
God brought Isaac. Huh? You know the story of what happened there. He got impatient again. He went to Ishmael. He went to a Haggai and got Ishmael. Come on. Still trying to make things happen in the flesh. Trying to make things happen your own way. Look at the big mess we're in today because of that. So wait on the prophetic promise that God has for you. And don't. Don't be discouraged. Amen. Don't be discouraged. I won't play something, please, for me. I just feel something. Play something soft, you know. Some instrumental something. Illuge, Milan, come up here. I'm going to use this other mic. You have prayed and you have believed for a miracle in your lives. God spoke to you and he said, I'm going to do it, but in my time. Isn't that right? But it's been kind of hard waiting. And sometimes it just made you feel discouraged. Especially when you see others you hear testimonies of others that haven't been waiting as long as you getting their papers and getting things settled and sometimes that brings a question of why and all I can tell you is this this morning God's got something greater for both of you can we just lift our hands toward our brother and sister because they've been waiting for a long time for them to get legal status. Sometimes, I don't know if you know what it feels like to be in a place where you're not really at home yet. Not sure of a country you belong to. But I know this family is part of our family and for His glory. And I know God's about to do something great. There is a prophetic utterance coming to you, sister. It's going to come within a week. When you're seeking God, God's going to speak to you. And he's going to tell you something. And if you be obedient to God, you and your husband, you're going to see God do a miraculous miracle in your life. And people are going to shake their heads and say, how was that ever done? And you're going to say, I don't know. I can't explain it. All I can tell you is this one word. God. So, Father, we pray for them, Lord. We pray for your prophetic word to be released upon their heart and upon their life. God, as they seek you, Father, I pray you reveal it to them and that, God, they will hold on to that word, that, God, in that word, Lord, you will bring fulfillment. Now, Lord, we pray against the spirit of discouragement, anxiousness, even doubt sometimes. And we let them know that we're standing with them and believing with them for a miracle. We thank you for their love. We thank you for their service in this church. We thank you, Lord, for their participation in all that they do. And we pray a blessing upon them. A blessing. A blessing, Father, financially. In the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah.